Welcome back to Comedian MTG. My name is Ian. Uh, as you might have noticed, I have a shirt on right now that uh, has a little bit of green that's being picked up on my green screen, but honestly, I thought it was too funny to, to not wear it. So I'm going to do that for this episode. On today's episode, I'm going to be breaking down the tournament I went to last weekend, which was the 95 Game Center, just sort of a bi-monthly... Yeah, so every other month uh, they do the CEDH tournament, up to 64 players. We only had 36 uh, at this one, but it was a five round cut to top 16 tournament. So I'm gonna tell you about my run this tournament and uh, we'll go from there. If you enjoy videos like this, make sure to hit like and subscribe as it helps out the channel a ton. While you're here on YouTube, those things help boost the video up and they are absolutely free. If you're also interested, go check out patreon.com slash comedian MTG as any support over there helps out uh, the channel and helps me continue to do this and uh, continue to create and make awesome videos and awesome tournament reports for you all in the audience. So thank you so much. Without any further ado, I say let's just jump on in. So let's talk about the deck I played for this tournament. I played uh, this deck that I've been calling Three Color Delny. I also named it Two Yoho uh, it's in the middle of the tournament because uh, we were talking about fun names for Malcolm decks for uh, this event. So I decided to play Malcolm Timna, which is a combination up until this point I had never played before. Um, and this combination was really interesting. I, I really found it to be like extremely consistent, right? Uh, big upsides of the combination is it's probably like the most compact, efficient commander pair there is in CEDH, right? The ability for Malcolm to generate you mana and be a consistent attacker for Timna and Timna to guarantee you that card advantage is like huge that the both of them provide advantage in such a way. Biggest downside is Esper has a little bit harder of a time winning the game than compared to a deck like Blue which gets like Breach and Dockside and, and better Adnaz lines and all that stuff. So a little interesting from that department here. Let's talk about our main win. I think this shirt is way too distracting. <laughs> oh, dang, that's so funny, though. <laughs> all right, we're back. Uh, so, yeah, as I mentioned, Malcolm Timna, I decided to play it because it's a combination I've wanted to try for a really long time, but hadn't really been inspired until the printing of this lovely card right here, Delny Streetwise Lookout. Now, this card is absolutely insane. This deck, it says creatures you control with power two or less can't be blocked by creatures with power three or greater. So it adds evasion for Timna situations, uh, helps your flyers get through Obnixilis, stuff like that. Uh, and more importantly, if an ability of a creature you control with power two or less triggers, that ability triggers an additional time. So now, whenever Delny is out, your pirates are making double treasures and your Timna is triggering twice, drawing you up to six cards per combat. Obviously quite powerful in this deck and it was the reason I was excited about trying out this combination. Whenever I got Delny out, it did a lot of work for sure. So definitely uh, proven the concept that it does work pretty well and um, the card is pretty sick. So. What are the main win cons for this list? Uh, obviously, we are an Esper list in CEDH, so we're doing the classic Thoracle Consult stuff, right? Demonic Consultation and uh, Tainted Pact, all of that stuff. Lovely, lovely spells there. Um, we also have uh, Teferi and Displacer Kitten, right? As you can see here, so Teferi Time Raveler is able to combo with uh, the lovely Displacer Kitten that we have here. As long as you have a zero drop rock or something that makes more mana or equal mana to what it costs to cast it, uh, you just bounce it over and over again, have it flickered fairy, and you're off to the races. What's the rest of the deck doing? Now we have some fun alternate win cons here, like Cabal uh, combined with a Blood Chief Ascension. Uh, basically, the idea of this being that this deck can be super grindy. You can you can really start to slow the game down gain a significant amount of advantage over your opponents, and these cards sort of help quantify that to actually putting a clock on the game, right? Cabal sort of taxes your opponents every time they try to interact with non-creatures, and that starts to add up every single time, right? Then Blood Chief Ascension also comes down pretty early. Both of your commanders trigger it as soon as they deal combat damage to a player, and it's pretty easy to get online. Now, I did not actually see Blood Chief for the entire tournament, which is rather unfortunate, and it's definitely not a card you like aggressively tutor for in certain circumstances. I didn't really have any games that went long enough where I would think about tutoring it, and I didn't have any that were just, you know, natural openers with Blood Chief. So uh, I still think the card is very good in the deck as an alternate win con, but it just didn't really come up. 
Apart from that, it's kind of like Esper good stuff, right? The, the idea of the list is to gain a bunch of advantage with our two commanders. Um, you'll see a couple of pirates in here, right? Changeling Outcast, Siren Storm Tamer, and Spectral Sailor. They are there because uh, they are super cheap, super easy to get down, right? Outcast is completely unblockable. The other two are both flyers that, are, that come down really, really early. Storm Tamer has the upside of protecting our creatures like Grand Abolishers or you know, uh, our Kite Cell Freebooter, or Kite Cell Larsonist, pardon me. Uh, and Spectral Sailor has Flash, which is really nice. You can hold up interaction unless you want to flash that guy in. He also has the pay one or pay four to draw a card ability, which doesn't really come up in the deck, but uh, it's nice to have as, as a backup. Definitely went for a few synergy pieces here, like the Kite Cell Larsonist, which did come in clutch for a couple of times that I've played this deck. Uh, it's just, you know, three removal spells stapled to one body, right? So it definitely does have an impact on the game and uh, comes in pretty handy when you need it to. We have Mnemonic Betrayal, sort of a, another alternate win con in this deck. Um, you'll notice there's a lot of these like triple black sort of uh, cost spells, right? Things like Beseech the Mirror, Yogg's Will, Praetor's Grasp, all of those, right? And I do have sort of a baseline support to to compromise with that strategy or to, to go along with that strategy, I should say, with Calling the Weak. We have Dark Ritual and we have uh, Cabal Ritual. Now we do have Adnaz in the deck. It's not a fantastic Adnaz deck, right? It's almost always a deck that you want to resolve an Adnaz at instant speed for, right? But with the amount of treasure that Malcolm can generate combined with the amount of extra mana we have, once again, through, through all those rituals we just talked about, there's occasionally times where you can try and go for it in your main phase. But um, statistically, it is not a great ad nauseum deck. We have a average mana value here of about 1.33 without any of like the red rituals there, right? Which is definitely a factor, right? So we never get a Dockside, we never get you know, Simeon, we don't get Rite of Flame, all of those things that, that can really help to accelerate uh, one out of some tough situations when you have red in the deck, right? So Ad Nas is definitely more there for the end step Nas, or once again, when we have so much mana we don't know what to do with. But a lot of these black rituals, once again, also double up for a lot of our spells here, like our Praetor's Graph and stuff like that. The, the toughest part of the deck is finding that win con, right? Sometimes it means using Predator's Grasp to win with, uh, you know, a deck with more colors win con, right? Like sometimes you take a, a Blue Farm's Breach or sometimes you take their Thoracle and use your consoles, right? A lot of the times, you know, and I can't stress that enough that when you're playing a deck that heavily relies upon Oracle console, right, as a main win con, on top of the fact that you are playing cards like Fairy Mastermind and, you know, Archivist of Ogma, these cards that are like not optional draws, right? That that can kill you if your opponents trigger them. The, your winning comes with a high risk, right? So for me, I would always feel a lot more comfortable going with the Displacer Kitten lines and Teferi in this deck because I know for a fact that that is going to be harder for my opponents to just sort of accidentally kill me with, right? If in general, when I was playing this deck a lot, I was hyper focusing on getting a Grand Abolisher down before I did anything else, right? Like, <laughs> or Teferi in the same respect, right? Where these cards are like guaranteeing that our own cards are not killing us, right? Basically making sure that we are not just dying to our own onboard effects or just, you know, the fact that Thassa's Oracle, the amount of consultation, despite being a compact combo, despite not really needing a lot of resources, is still a very flimsy combo. I mean, instants are the most counterable card type, right? So that's something to be thought about a lot, right? Like is if it's an instant, it can be hit pretty easily. So just like jamming a Thoracle Consult is not really an effective way of winning the game quite a lot, as opposed to Thoracle Consult with backup or Grand Abolishers or stuff like that to that, you know, really lock in the fact that you're going for these clean wins, right? Yeah, if anyone has any like specific questions about some of the inclusions in this list, one, the list is going to be pinned in the description down below this video. And two, I'd love to hear about any sort of questions folks have about the deck in the comments down below. Um, you know, at, at some base level, an Esper deck that plays a lot of high value cards is not going to have the, the craziest brew sort of potential here uh, where you're going to see a bunch of really weird cards that don't do, you know, very specific things. But each and every card definitely has a very specific purpose in this list, right? Some of the stuff is pretty obvious as far as like, oh, well, that's a card you play in Esper, right? But, you know, there's definitely things like touch and stuff like that that are like, you know, these channel abilities that come in so clutch in the current metagame. Each and every card for this deck was definitely very specifically included. And, you know, it kind of feels good to, to have a list where you're like, yeah, every single card I feel very confident with and chose with a very specific purpose um, because, you know, it's not everything is just like 
a unique pick for the commander specifically, but it's all very high card quality cards, right? And therefore you sort of get to take this idea of like, here's the best of the best, you know, and not necessarily saying cards like, yeah, <laughs> Spectral Sailor are the best of the best, right? But best of the best when it comes to representing the high synergy that it gains when you use it with your commander combined with the fact that you know it is just a really efficient body plus your commander makes it exceptionally strong and therefore better than other bodies in this deck specifically and we'd like to thank one of our sponsors for today tales of adventure magic they are an awesome store and vendor you'll see them at a ton of different events throughout the year and they always have a crazy inventory and especially for those who really like bling they have uh, an awesome online store as well and all the information for that will be in the description down below You can check that out and get five percent off if you use code comedian at checkout, which is pretty cool So round one the first round of this tournament um, I get a buy <laughs> Me and three other folks got a buy for this first round um, you know, it's not exactly how I love starting off a local tournament. I can't complain because a free win is a free win, right? But um, yeah, they were not doing three player pods in this tournament. So three people were handed buys, uh, which I don't really know how I feel about that. Um, in general, I like the, the dynamic of three player games messes up so many pods. And I totally understand that part, but also introducing a bunch of free wins into a 36 player tournament definitely messes up a lot of the breakers i think um so for me i don't know that i, I particularly love that there were a bunch of buys thrown out during this tournament but uh it is what it is and you know i'm not gonna boohoo getting a a, a free win on round one <laughs> so round two i'm playing against rogsai Gracios Akiri, then it's myself, and in fourth place is actually Anikthia. So it was a it was a pretty spicy deck that we saw coming out of uh, round one with a win. Uh, Anikthia, we didn't really know what it was doing. We you know through the course of the game we saw it play a bunch of enchantments, but I figured it was some sort of high value enchantment plus reanimator sub theme style deck, right? Which it ended up being. So Thrasios Akiri and myself both start out with Gemstone Caverns. Uh, the major difference is I was on a seven and Thrasios Kiri was on a five. So they they just jam a gemstone right away, right? Rock's Eye plays Rog Out, plays Phyrexian Tower, plays one other spell, plays Mana Vault, and tries to jam the turn one Adnos <laughs> uh, by sacking Rograk and tapping the Mana Vault. And I believe it was like Simeon for the Mana Vault or whatever. Um, but they just on the play turn one Adnaz. And, uh, you know, at this point I'm looking at my opening hand, which does have a force of will in it, uh, but no blue card. So I was like, oh no, are we done for? Luckily, Thrasio Sekiri had a mind break trap, right? Um, now this does put Thrasio Sekiri pretty far behind in this game. On the other hand, they really don't have another choice because letting Rogsai have a turn one ad nauseum is not exactly going to help their position either, right? Like they got the mind break trap, they're, they're going to use it. Um, so Rograk gets kind of blown out there. Uh, the Mana Vault sapped all that stuff. Uh, they go to Thrasios Akiri. Um, before they even untap, they actually worldly tutor for Dockside, which I was really surprised by because uh, Rog had played an artifact so far and you know it was kind of like informing all of us that they were going to use this dock side eventually right so now all of us are like playing around the definite fact that there's a dock side and there's a difference between like playing around the possibility of a dock side and playing around the definite fact that a dock side exists right and so that gets revealed they then go to their turn and just pay two mana for Thrasios. Which is like, I, I feel like I personally would have sandbagged the Worldly Tutor a little bit. But at the same time, like if you're tapping up for Thrasios, you don't get to Worldly Tutor later on too, right? I just I thought it was a really interesting way to do it. And you just give up a draw, right, for, for a Dockside later on. Um, but you give up that first draw of the game when you're already on a multi five that had to use a gemstone and a piece of interaction before your first turn, right? So Thrasios Kiri is down pretty low on resources at this point, right? I play uh, a land and I play Malcolm off the crypt, uh, my mana crypt specifically. Anikthia plays an Esper Sentinel. So now I have a mana crypt, one land, and uh, a land open. So Rogsai goes to their turn, 
they get a little more mana and they're able to play Imperial Recruiter for a Thassa's Oracle. So now all of us are like on high alert. Are they gonna, you know, jam the Thoracle right away? And it kind of got more clear as the game went on that they didn't actually have a follow-up for the Thassa's Oracle. They just had the Thassa's Oracle there because they wanted to use the Imp Recruiter. There weren't really any better targets and they wanted the possibility of like maybe if they draw Demonic or Tainted Pack later in the game or any other tutor, they they know they have a combo, which, you know, it's interesting. I don't really know what else was in the list. And, you know, Imp, Imp Recruiter is not exactly uh, commonly played in Rock's Eye anyway, so it was definitely an interesting choice for that one. At this point, I realized I made a mistake by letting the Esper Sentinel resolve because I have an Enlightened Tutor in hand and I want to go grab a Mystic Remora. And I should have done that with the Esper Sentinel from Anikvia's uh, on the stack, right? I should have jammed the Esper Sentinel up and then, but also part of me was like, oh, do I want to reveal all this information? I don't know what Rockside is going to do. I don't know what Thrasus Kiri is going to do. Not that they're going to do much right its turn two. And, and Rockside just got blown out specifically. So Thrasus Kiri then goes and plays Dockside for four, right? They make four treasures off of the stuff that we have on the battlefield. And at that point, I hit the Enlightened Tutor with the, the treasures on the stack. Uh, go grab a fish. And yeah, so it makes four treasures. We're all just kind of like, okay, sure, and that's fine. And it's it's sort of like hold up Thrasios activation. It was, it was you know, from, from their perspective, they, they claimed it as like a defensive move, right? Like playing the dock side, getting enough treasures to activate Thrasios in case things go wrong, right? Goes back to me. I play Timna. I play Mystic Remora. Go to combat, make some treasures, draw some cards, have Mystic Remora up. Feeling great, right? This is this is kind of exactly where you want to be in this type of game. You have the mid-range plan going pretty strong where you are just trying to draw a bunch of cards and make some treasures, right? Like that's literally what this deck does. <laughs> so at this point, it's kind of chill for an entire turn cycle, right? La Anikthia plays like an enchantment on one of their lands. I get some draws off of that. Rogside just like holds up stuff, passes. Uh, Thrasios Akiri doesn't want to crack all four treasures for Thrasios activation, so they just don't do anything on end step and then they untap their lands and pass again, right? Classic Thrasios with, with being mana screwed in situation, right? So it goes back to me, I literally go to combat again, pay for the fish, draw some more cards, do all of that stuff, right? I'm just happy to take my time in this type of pod because everyone's sort of on the back foot from the first two turns anyways, right? So we then pass with a bunch of cards in hand, bunch of counter magic though, right? Like not a lot to like do per se, but it's like, Force and Fluster and Miscast and like a bunch of stuff, right? So then Anikthia puts Grasp of Fate on the stack. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, like they could eat my fish, they could eat my Malcolm, they could eat my Timna. It's really not the end of the world. I'm not ready to expend a Force of Will on on this. And my other counter magic is all instance and sorcery countering stuff, right? So I'm like, yeah, maybe I'll have to lose a bit of tempo and play my commander back out of the command zone next turn, but I'm not really pressed about it, right? With that grasp on the stack, I do end up drawing an Orcish Bowmasters, which is pretty nice, and I definitely don't hate that. So Grasp of Fate is on the stack. It enters the battlefield with the ability on the stack. Uh, it targets the, I want to say, I don't remember what it takes from Rog. Oh, because Rog played, Rograk played Rograk for two on the last turn. So Grasp of Fate comes down, targets Rograk, targets my Malcolm, and targets, no, targets my Timna, pardon me. Yeah, targets my Timna, targets Rograk, and targets Thrasios from, from Thrasikiri. And Thrasikiri digs once with Thrasios, finds uh, Legolas's Quick Reflexes, which I'm kind of surprised they like jammed it over this interaction uh, to protect the Thrasios there, but at the same time, they were already pretty far behind, right? So they do that. I think I actually wait on the Bowmasters until after this exchange happens, I'm pretty sure. So that whole happens, they, they do their things. I draw a couple cards off from Mora. I do not care about Timna going away. I'll just, once again, pay five for it on my next turn. So it, it's really whatever. So that Grasp of Fate happens. Those things get exiled. It's a bit of a tempo loss, but no big deal. I flash in the OBM, shoot down the Esper Sentinel from Anikthia. Goes back into Rograk's turn. Rograk does nothing again. They just pass. Now, Thrasikiri plays Derevi at this point. And Derevi is definitely one of those cards that can very aggressively pull 
a deck that's been struggling back out from the brink, right? So they move to combat, they start swinging in, get a, a couple untaps, basically enough to get an activation's worth. So go back to my turn, I let the Mystic Mora die, I replay Timna, I go to combat, get some treasures, get some card draw, right? I don't love like fully tapping out except for the treasure that I have before we go into the next turn, but at the end of the day, I think I have like a couple mana up because I didn't pay for the fish, right? Which ends up being good. I was trying to be responsible at this point, right? Uh, there's there's a certain level of like, yeah, my Esper deck is drawing a bunch of cards, making a bunch of mana, but like, as I mentioned, the, the hand was just like chock full of counter spells, right? So it's it's definitely a deck that is very much trying to play for the longer game, right? It's and you, you see how Tivit plays in a normal game, so it, it's very much that same way, right? Go back to Anicthea's turn. They untap and they assassin's trophy malcolm right and i'm like not feeling great about it i have a few more things as backup at this point right so i'm not particularly super worried about it right i at this point hit him with a miscast right and then anicthia mana tithes me and i'm kind of like oh geez okay i have only two treasures left at this point do i crack a treasure to pay for this mana tithe or do I just let Malcolm go away and I decide you know what I, I think I can afford the one treasure but I was definitely thinking about it a lot because I didn't I was very afraid of like over tapping going into the turn of uh, Thrasio Sekiri right then we go back to Rogzai he does nothing basically again the Thrasio Sekiri player hits an activation of Thrasios and reveals a meal, right? So we're all like, okay, this is this is gonna be very real very quickly, right? So on their turn, it gets back to them. They go to Wargate for X equals zero. And for those who don't know, Wargate for X equals zero goes and grabs Gaia's Cradle in this situation. They already have Derevi, so Derevi plus Emil plus Gaia's Cradle and one other creature. You just need, well, I sorry, two other creatures. You need four creatures in the battlefield, which they would have had at that point. Starts to make infinite mana because you just flicker Derevi, you untap the Gaia's Cradle, Gaia's Cradle taps for hopefully at least four mana, uh, and you start netting infinite green mana, and you can then filter that to all your colors. So with Thrasios on board, doesn't even need to filter into all the other colors. It's a win, right? They Wargate for zero. I hit it with one of my, uh, my Swan Song, I believe. I still have the Force of Will back up in case this turns into a giant fight, but as I mentioned, they were sort of low on resources getting up to this point and everything they had drawn up to this point was just stuff that was progressing their own game plan pretty aggressively right so like the emil the drevi all stuff like that um but that also meant that they were light on interaction we get back to my turn and i'm feeling pretty good about it because at this point rog thras hasn't done or sorry rog sai has not done much at all this whole time uh thrasio zakiri if they had interaction they probably would have used it to defend their own win on their own turn right and Anicthea is used their mana tithe, they use their ass Assassin's Trophy, right? I ironically, one of the most responsible decks in the entire pod uh, was this Anicthea deck, but they've used all of their interaction on me during their own turn, right? So I'm feeling pretty good about my turn here. I get a Grand Abolisher and I go to play that. The idea here, and this is something I accidentally sort of gave away at one point, was during a bunch of the Bowmasters draws early on, I went to target the Imperial Recruiter and I was like, oh wait, Actually, I'm going to target something else. I'm going to hit your face to the rock side player um, because I wanted the Imperial Recruiter around because I had a flesh duplicate, right? So I was going to be able to flesh duplicate, get the Imperial Recruiter, go grab my fastest Oracle, win the game, right? But because I had sort of revealed that information earlier when I put the flesh duplicate on the stack after the Grand Abolisher, the Arthrasio Sekiri pilot looks over to Rogsai and says, hey, I think he needs to copy that Imperial Recruiter to win, sack it to the year for Xian Tower, which once again, we talked about them having it since turn one. Uh, and they did. They did sack it there, which was very good, very well timed by my opponents. But I luckily for myself did have a backup plan. So I was able to cast uh, Cabal Ritual for the X equals uh, for the threshold, right? Uh, so I made five black mana off of that. Uh, I'm able to cast Beseech the Mirror, sacrificing a treasure to go grab Thassa's Oracle out of my deck. That enters the battlefield, and I have Demonic Constitution in hand, hence my Imperial Recruiter play earlier. So, uh, able to get game two with a very protected Thassa's Oracle. Uh, it's definitely one of those things where, this is one of those games where I was like, okay, looking at the Grand Abolisher, okay, how can my opponents blow me out? Because, like, once again, Thassa's Oracle, I consider it a pretty fragile combo, right? 
So I'm, you know, looking around at all those possibilities for when my opponents can interact, how they can interact, and, and how they can actually stop the combo as it's going through. So round three. Uh, it's myself in first spot, Blue Farm in second, Thrasios, Bruce in third, and Kenrith in fourth. There are only two 2-0 -oh players at the moment, which is myself and the Thrasios Bruce player. And, you know, it's it's definitely a pod of, uh, I believe, the best records there. And I believe uh, one of the pods was one win, one draw. And then the other one, I wasn't sure if they had one win, one loss, or one win, one draw. But either way, it's, it's some configuration of that. We go into it, and I keep a very risky hand. It is no lands, but there's a Chrome Mox, a Soul Ring, a Lotus Petal, and a One Ring. And a couple other things. And... I look at it and it's, you know, turn one Malcolm into at worst case scenario, I double miss my land drop a turn two one ring. And to me, that's still pretty good. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's risky because there are three potential Dockside decks here in this pod. And that does come up for sure. But at the same time, it's a really good way to ensure my own game plan is going. So I go for it, right? I do as I suspect there with that turn one Malcolm. I miss in the land drop turn one. I miss in the land drop turn two. I miss in the land drops for, for a hot minute, but that's okay. Uh, but basically, yeah, I miss that land drop. Uh, we go into blue farm. Uh, blue farm doesn't really do much turn one. I believe they just like mox diamond land pass. Uh, Thrasios Bruce. I don't even remember what they play on turn one. I think it's literally just like a dork or something. And then Kenrith plays land pass. I go for the turn to one ring, feeling great about that after I hit with with Malcolm to deal some combat damage. Unfortunately, I did miss both of those land drops, as I mentioned, so that part's not exactly feeling fantastic. I, I draw from the one ring, still missing the land drop. Tough, but you know, it happens, it happens. Thrasios Bruce develops uh, another creature. I think it's like one more dork or something like that, or they just maybe play a land and already have the dork up. And then we go to Kenrith, who plays a turn to Dranith, uh, which he, this Dranith Magistrate does come into play as, as the game begins to progress, for sure. Dranith happens, it gets back to me, uh, and I have uh, the draw for turn being Rhystic Study. At this point, I think I hit one land drop here, and, and it might have been turn two, might have been now, but I, I know I hit at least one land drop at this point with the one ring draws and all that stuff. Uh, so, you know, I've drawn three off the one ring at this point, too. So I play a Risky Study. I'm clearly just in, in the middle of a, of a value town, right? I've got my Malcolm. I don't have Timna out yet, but I have a Risky Study and I have a one ring. Uh, luckily, those both resolve, right? So we go to Blue Farm's turn, and then the thing I was most afraid of happens, right? Which is uh, they immediately... And, and I don't know if I had said, but Blue Farm also plays a turn two Rhystic study, right? So so Blue Farm already has a Rhystic out when I'm playing my Rhystic and, and going through all that. Um, I don't think I fed them through that exchange. I think I kept up mana with while also... Or no, I think I had to tap out to pay the Rhystic study for them. Yeah, but they go and play uh, Dockside, which I did not have an answer to. And they Dockside making... It's like five or six at this point. Uh, they cast a Cabal Ritual, they cast a Tainted Pact, right? And so at this point, we're, I'm, I'm drawing, not really getting anything that is a solution uh, to our current predicament, but uh, they're drawing a bunch of cards, and oh, you know what? Thrasius Bruce has an Esper Sentinel, because they also are drawing a bunch of cards throughout this exchange as well. Okay, that's right, because I think by the end of this current exchange, they have like nine cards in their hand, and it's stacked. <laughs> So Thrasios Bruce has an Esper out. Uh, so Blue Farm is tainted acting into my Rhystic, their Esper, and digs and digs and digs until they find a Wheel of Fortune. Now, there were already like 20 something cards down in their library. And um, we talked to them during, and they were like, yeah, I was either gonna stop at Ad Nauseum or at Wheel of Fortune. And the idea being like Ad Nause, there was a chance of winning, right? So they, they were looking at the wheel and basically being like, yeah, I could keep pushing for the Nas, which probably ups the chances of winning if you get the Nas reasonably soon. But if they didn't, then we would have died multiple times. Like, like basically, had they gone for the Nas, there was a solid chance they exile too much of their library and they can't win either, right? Because they'd already hit like some some decent stuff in the way digging down for the Wheel of Fortune, right? So 
They choose the wheel, they jam the wheel, and it ends up being a really good <laughs> call because uh, Thrasios Bruce discards nine cards, including like uh, Kutzel, a Dockside of their own, uh, Emil already in hand, some counter magic, like some more fast mana, like all crazy stuff. I also have like nine cards in my hand at this point because I have been uh, drawing off the Ristic Study from Blue Farm's turn, right? So like the wheel definitely disrupts the advantage that both Thrasios Bruce and I were both gaining by having these passive pieces out, right? And it was almost guaranteed that had it gone back to Bruce Thrasios' turn, they just won the game, like period, no questions asked, right? So well-timed wheel. Uh, Blue Farm plays a couple rocks gives us a card or two, and then tries to play a Necropotence and is like, hey, look, I'm not gonna win with this Necro this turn, I'm probably gonna name five. And my thought process was that, you know, everything sort of just got disrupted, you know, we are sort of at this reset period, right? I just watched Thrasios Bruce ch chuck away a, a significant amount of their win cons, um, and it's not this turn that I'm concerned about from the Necro from Blue Farm, it's the turn afterwards, right? So for that reason, I hit them with the Fierce Guardianship. We go to Thrasios Bruce. They play, I don't even particularly remember. Oh yeah, so they play a Tezzeret and pull into a one ring, right? So that's, you know, definitely a little bit scary. Um, it's because they're now also doing the whole one ring thing with me and they still have this Esper Sentinel out. But more importantly, Kenrith untaps, pays three mana and just plays a Cutzel. We're like, okay, Kenrith is winning next turn is what I'm seeing from this board state, right? Uh, I, at this point in my hand, have an Odawara, and I think I already also have touched the Spirit Realm, right? So like, my plan is to not die to the Cutzel and not go for it when there's very clearly a win being set up across the table for me, right? So I'm like, all right, I'll play the patient game. I'll, I don't think I even developed too many resources because I like had you know, Ristic and One Ring, right? So I can be patient with it. I don't even activate the One Ring during my turn because I'm going to have to go to clean up and discard a bunch of cards, right? So I'm like, okay, I'm actually just going to pass after going to combat hitting with Malcolm, making a treasure, etc. right? Blue Farm sort of does nothing in passes. Uh, I think, you know, hitting that Necro hit them pretty hard. And reminder, there's still the Draineth out, right? So it's not like they can just play Timna or Krom, right? They can't really get out of that situation. Uh, Thrasios Bruce plays Minamo <laughs> as their land for turn, which we're all like, oh, yikes, and then proceeds to just pass, right? So they're very clearly going to do the draw with ring, untap, draw with ring again thing and try and win on their turn, right? So Kenrith untaps, plays Underworld Breach. We go around the table. Uh, I am first in priority order, right? So I Odawara the Cutzel, right, with the Underworld Breach on the stack. With the Odawara on the stack, Kenrith fires off a Veil of Summer. Now, Veil of Summer does not protect the Cutzel in this scenario, right, because Odawara is a colorless land, right? So it can't be stopped by Veil of Summer. But what does happen uh, is that they are then able to resolve an uncounterable Veil of Summer with an Underworld Breach on the stack, meaning that Underworld Breach is not able to be countered, right? Uh, which definitely makes things a little bit messier for this situation. So Cutzel gets bounced back to hand, uh, Underworld Breach ends up resolving, but reminder, there are two Ristics and an Esper Sentinel at this point. So uh, Kenrith plays a Lion's Eye Diamond, Cracks the Lion's Eye Diamond, uh, goes to cast a Demonic Tutor out of the graveyard, once again, all uncounterable. Um, but at this point, we've all drawn a bunch of cards and Blue Farm is able to draw into a silence, right? So in response to the Demonic Tutor, they silence them. Uh, Kenrith is able to still tutor with Demonic Tutor, uh, but they do not, you know, just win the game at this point, right? Now, at this point also, while uh, before I actually uh, cast the Odawara, uh, I drew off my one ring, Thrasios Bruce drew off the one ring, did the untap, draw off the one ring thing, right? So like at this point, it is very clear to me that if it gets back to Thrasios Bruce's turn, we are just dead, right? So I know that this is my window. I don't think Blue Farm and I can fight off everything that Thrasios Bruce has going on for this next turn, right? 
So I draw for my turn and I have a vampiric tutor in hand, right? And I'm like, I want to be able to try and push with the Grand Abolisher, right? I've been talking about how much I'm prioritizing that card in this deck. Let's try and get my Grand Abolisher out, right? So I vamp tutor and I do this in my main phase because I have the one ring, right? So I just will be able to draw off one ring, right? Um, the vamp tutor gets hit with a miscast. I try to miscast back. Uh, and then it gets hit by another counter spell on top of that, right? So my Vamp Tutor gets fizzled, um, and I go, okay, time to draw off the One Ring. Now, my One Ring draws in this situation were exactly what I needed, because <laughs> uh, I sort of had like pieces of everything going on, but I kind of like couldn't string everything together, and it was like the last piece I needed, and like two counter spells, right? It was, I think it was like Force and Pact, right? Um, which ended up coming in very clutch at this point, right? So definitely got a little bit lucky with these one ring draws. Um, I actually don't know if it gave me the piece I needed, but I knew I didn't have backup was, was more so the problem, right? So yeah, I get, I get the, the counter magic there, right? I'm able to go, okay, play three mana to fairy, right? Three mana to fairy is on the stack. Uh, it gets hit by a force. I counter with a pact of negation. Uh, they counter with a Pact of Negation, and I hit that with a Force, right? So we get Force, Pact, Pact, Force, um, in that order. Uh, luckily at this point, everyone's out of stuff, right? Um, so Teferi hits the field, and I'm able to, with my very minimal mana left over, uh, bounce one of my things, uh, play it again, which gives me not exactly enough mana to, um, and I also believe I have Mox Diamond in hand too, just in case that didn't quite work and I was able to go to combat with Malcolm. So, you know, I, I still had a little bit of extra mana, but then I'm able to uh, get my uh, Demonic Constellation, cast the Oracle, cast Demonic Constellation, and uh, win the game. So, this pod is kind of wild. It's in seat one is Chizgoria, which is a deck I've seen a lot of people try to brew for CEDH, and it's super sick. Um, then in seat two is uh, Falhorn, which if anyone knows, that's Billy Mitchell, who is, you know, a longtime match player uh, and who has been sort of uh, pushing for this Falhorn deck for, for quite some time. Then there's myself in third seat, and then we have Oscar Rubbish Reclaimer in, in seat four, which is pretty cool. Chizgoria just leads us off by playing a turn one Arkham's Astrolabe. Um, I keep a hand that I was kind of humming and hawing over. I have like two lands. I have a Vamp Tutor, but specifically I have Dranith Magistrate and I also have Dauntless Dismantle, right? So with Dranith and Dauntless, I'm feeling very good about the pod I'm facing, right? Because if you look at Oscar, if you look at Chizgorian, and if you look at Faldhorn, they all have abilities that one, care about the commander, two, they all care about casting things from alternative zones, right? Chizgoria casts things from exile. Faldhorn cares about things being cast from exile or played from exile, and uh, Oscar cares about things being cast from the graveyard, right? So I'm like, if I land a Dranith in this pod, it's going to be backbreaking, right? So the hand is basically a hand where I can vamp tutor turn one, get a mana crypt, and then turn two, I can play Dranith and Dauntless in the same turn, right? So that's my game plan going into it, and that does end up working out. So I vamp tutor that first turn, get the Dranith, get the Dauntless out, which is very, very solid. Then everyone sort of grinds to to a halt. Oscar is sort of just doing the land pass thing. They're they're very clearly like a, a more controlling Demir deck, uh, the way that this one is is built. And I was talking with the pilot, and they said, yeah, there was one game where they didn't even cast Oscar for a while, and you know they've also had games where they didn't cast Oscar at all. You know, or it's just much more of a like late game finisher style control commander, right? So Chizgoria is just kind of like playing a lot of artifacts and passing, right? Like that's sort of their MO for this game. Then we go to the Falhorn, um, and they follow up with a Sylvan Ivory, which, you know, when your commander is locked out, it's pretty good. Those first two turns, they had played like Inti, uh, Seneschal of the Sun, and at that point, Inti is just not doing anything anymore because of the Draenith out, right? I'm able to play Timna, get some card draws off of that, feeling pretty good about this point. I have interaction in hand, I have like a, a bunch of decent stuff here, right? At this point in the game, Oscar is not doing a ton. They're, they're playing a patient game. Chizgoria is fully locked out. So right now it's sort of this like back and forth between Billy and I, right? Uh, on on Faldhorn, which is, you know, can his advantage engines keep up with the, the stacks that I'm playing and the speed in which I'm developing my engines too, right? 
We get back to Billy's turn. He plays an Allosaur Shepherd and then EEs his Inti uh, into a Toski, right? So he can start getting some card draw that way. This is when I play Delny. I go to combat because I have Timna, my attackers, and I have Delny out. And in response to, well, post declared attackers in response to moving to blocks, my opponent uh, playing Oscar casts a dress down, right? Which is going to take me off four draws at this point, right? And I obviously don't want to lose a bunch of draws, right? Uh, because I would, yeah, everyone's gonna be down four. I can't hit everybody here in this situation, hence me saying the four. So I'm, I'm hitting two people and gonna be able to double activate Timna for, for two draws, right? Um, so in response to the enter the battlefield draw effect of dress down, because Oscar only has one more mana available, uh, I actually chain the vapor the dress down, right? And I still have enough interaction in my hand and my stacks pieces are, are effective enough where I'm not too worried about them having a dress down in their hand. And if anything, I actually want them to keep the dress down because I don't quite know how Billy's deck wins, right? And with the combination of them having Sylvan Library, them having Toski, I'm kind of a little worried that like they could do some creature combo nonsense before Oscar or I can do anything about it. So I'm like, no, actually, please keep this dress down. <laughs> I connect, I draw four cards, uh, which really sets me up for the next turn. We go to Oscar's turn and they do something really heads up, which I thought was a very good play. So they were basically in a position where they had said like, they don't need to get their commander out during the next couple turns, right? And like, they can wait for Dranith, but they saw how effective Dranith was at stopping Billy and stopping the Chizgoria deck, right? So they put a Toxic Deluge on the stack, but they actually only pay two life into it, right? Which is exactly enough to kill Billy's Allosaurus Shepherd, Billy's Toski, my Delny, my Dranith, no, not my Dranith, pardon me, my Timna, right? So like all of my card draw is getting wiped off and what's staying is the Dauntless Dismantler and the Dranith Magistrate, which are not gaining the advantage until Timna comes back down, right? Which at the time, I think I would have had to completely tap out to, to, to get Timna going at this point, right? So it, I think it was a very smart way to use the Deluge where it was like very surgical, right? Like taking out exactly enough stuff that was controlling our advantage, but not removing the stacks pieces that they didn't care about, but our, my other opponents did. So that was a really heads up play. Unfortunately, at this point, uh, they did still have to use the Toxic Deluge and can't hold up the dress down, right? So we go to Chizgoria's turn. They didn't lose anything to the board wipe, but they've just been playing artifacts this whole time. And, and because they don't have access to their commander, they're not really doing much, right? Um, Faldhorn's turn comes around. Uh, they just play some sort of advantage piece, but aren't really doing much of anything because in combination of the board wipe and uh, my stacks pieces are like pretty much completely locking him out of the game. Um, you know, did a couple of draws off Sylvan Library and like played a, played a dork or two. End step, I just cast a Tainted Pact and I dig for my Thassa's Oracle. Um, no one has an answer to my Tainted Pact. We go to my turn, I jam a Silence. Nobody has response to silence, and then I play Oracle Console and I win the game. Uh, <laughs> that part was, was pretty, you know, clean. It, the, really, the, the difference was me fighting over the dress down uh, to get those four draws was exactly what I needed to do at the time. The X equals two Toxic Deluge didn't affect my win attempt there, right? So I still think Oscar made a very uh, smart decision in in being very surgical with that Deluge, and I think it was a really heads up play. Uh, but sometimes, you know, the table runs low on resources and there's really not much you can do about it, right? Because it's not like they could have let me have that board state for another turn, right? So they had to deluge and Billy having that board state also didn't help either. And it's not like Chizgoria or Aldehorn could really do a lot about the way I specifically went about winning, right? Which is the silent into the Oracle console, right? So a bit of a tough situation for my opponents not really having enough answers to deal with, you know, just these cards that can only get really dealt with in a very narrow window, especially when you're not playing other blue decks, right? So now at this point, I am 4-0. 3-0, oh, but like 4-0, oh, you know what I mean? Uh, three, three actual wins, one buy. Um, going into round five of Swiss, we get into the pod, our opponents go, yeah, uh, we can we can definitely draw at this point and just lock in our top 16 spots. And I was like, yeah, I, I have zero desire to play because I'm already at four wins. So it really does not matter to me, whatever, like, 
you know, if I play, I'm probably still locked first seat because I have four wins at this point. Or if I draw, I have four wins and one draw. And it, it's great. First seat either way, right? So yeah, we draw. I lock in first seat at the end of the Swiss. Feeling really good about that. Splendid job! Before we get into the semifinals, just a reminder here on Comedian MTG that we do CEDH coaching. Yes, that is a uh, full-time thing here at Comedian MTG. If you are interested in receiving coaching, I've had a number of coaching recipients do really well in tournaments as of late. Um, that had someone top four pretty recently at a major chaos event, stuff like that. Uh, my people who have been coaching have been doing really, really well, and it's super awesome to see. You can find all of the ways to contact me in the description down below, but you can find me at comedianmtg at gmail.com. You can find me at comedian underscore mtg at discord or at Twitter over at comedian mtg. Just feel free to message me at any of those places uh, and we can set up a coaching session. They are super awesome. They've been super helpful for a lot of folks. And, you know, uh, we have a pretty, pretty extensive resume over here. So, you know, if you want uh, someone who can help you get to that next level of CEDH play, come check it out. And one of our sponsors for today is the brand new tournament Salt Fest. This is by a group called the Salt Monolith. They're going to be down in Florida. I unfortunately am double booked for that weekend. I was hoping to make it out to this tournament, but it's a CEDH 10K main event. They're a brand new group and I've been in contact with them for a couple months and they're hoping to put on some pretty crazy CEDH tournaments. It's a 256 person cap with uh, some, once again, a, a, a 10K for prizes, right? And I know a number of different people from the community are gonna be there. It's looking pretty sweet and y'all should go check it out. The website is right there. So go to the saltmonolith.com for details, or you can check it out on the Top Deck website, which is also gonna have all that information available. It's, a, it's gonna be an Eminence Gold event too for those who are looking to get some extra points on the leaderboard, which is pretty sick. So the semifinals are myself in seat one, then Obnixilis, Captive Kingpin in seat two. We have Blue Farm in seat three, and we have Sisse in seat four. Um, my hand is basically a turn one and step. I'll cast a Spectral Sailor and then curve that into a turn two Malcolm, start making some treasures, turn three, trying to draw some cards basically. Blue Farm gambles on turn one, pitching a Lotus Petal, which we did find out later that that was something that, that mattered a decent amount. Um, Ob, I think, either plays a Talisman turn one or turn two, and then passes it up. Sisse sort of develops a Dork and then passes back to me. Uh, I get the Malcolm down, as I mentioned, make the treasure, uh, move to the next turn. So at this point, it, uh, Ob is passing. It gets to me, Blue Farm sort of has to pass because, it, you know, it's clear the gamble did backfire for them, right? And Sisse cast Legolas's Quick Reflexes uh, on their Ignoble Hierarch and goes to combat and because of the Exalted trigger uh, is able to shoot down my Malcolm. So I play... Uh, Timna and I play Dauntless Dismantler on that next turn. I don't have Malcolm back out. Um, then Obnixilis plays Obnixilis. Blue Farm finally gets the land they need. They play a Rhystic Study and we're like, okay, that's the thing that they were trying to gamble for early on in the game. In response to the Rhystic Study, uh, Sisse casts a Vamp Tutor and goes and grabs Italian. So the game starts to shift at this point because of the Malcolm play where I'm not really as much of a problem as I could be at this point and Blue Farm starts to get really ahead because their Rhystic gets fed pretty decently. Um, <laughs> so I replay Malcolm, go to combat, get some attacks, draw some cards, make some treasures, etc. Um, make treasure, I should say. Um, we go to Ob's turn and they start because one of the pings uh, in the progression of, of the turn post playing Obnixilis revealed an Orcish Bowmasters. Um, so Ob starts being like, yeah, I can, I can just kind of push a little bit here because I can just play a Bowmasters and like, it's not really going to hurt us as much, which ends up not really being, I mean, uh, for those, you know, who, who played decent amount, like the, the Bowmaster's pings are not the equivalent of a draw off a Rhystic Study, right? Like a, a draw off a Rhystic Study in a deck like Blue Farm is always going to be infinitely more valuable, right? So the way Ob sort of sequences things, they like go to play a gamble. It gets misstepped by uh, Sisse. In response to the Rhystic Study draws, they try to flash in the Bowmasters. And we were kind of talking about it after the game. We were like, it was a very like, half 
hearted way of like jamming at that point, right? Because like they we, we eventually found out later in the game too, they had a red elemental blast in their hand. Um, so like if they were going to be more proactive about it, they probably should have blasted the Ristic study. And if they wanted to be more reactive, then they could have just played the Bowmasters and instead like gone to combat. Um, so they're giving Ristic Study Blue Farm a bunch of cards at this point. Um, I think they have like three or four from this exchange. Um, and at least they start listening to reason and they're like, okay, sure, like I'm gonna go to combat and at least hit Blue Farm to take them off winning, right? So they at least hit Blue Farm and then we go to Blue Farm's turn. And Blue Farm then plays Smothering Tide, right? So now we're all very much on high alert because they have the mana, they have the card draw, right? They already have a pretty decent hand. We were kind of convinced there was a chance that they jammed it on their turn, but I think they needed the extra mana from Smothering Tide to really get things going at like 100%, right? So Sisse with Talion just holds up mana, passes the turn. I go to attacks, get a couple cards, hold up mana, pass the turn, right? I have a decent amount of mana at this point, right? Ob, between the Talion triggers and Ob Nixilis attacks, Ob goes to combat on their turn and puts Blue Farm to eight life, right? And just passes, right? So we know at this point, uh, Sisse is holding up mana. <laughs> I'm holding up like six mana and Ob Nixilis is holding up a red blast, right? Which we, which we once again figure out a little bit later uh, to stop Blue Farm. Blue Farm is also at eight life, right? So they can cast a maximum of four spells into Talion, right? But I think they also recognize that they need to go now because the rest of the table is not gonna let them live through the rotation of the table, right? Uh, and also obviously the, the longer they exist underneath Talion, the less and less stuff that they're gonna be able to cast moving forward, right? So Blue Farm plays a Ranger Captain, which I look at my hand, which has like, uh, Tainted Pact, a Fierce Guardianship, a Miscast, like a bunch of stuff that does not <laughs> help uh, against a Ranger Captain. Uh, Sisse looks at me very, very confused and desperate and like, I don't have anything here, right? So I cast a Tainted Pact, right? And this Tainted Pact just immediately starts punishing me. Like, I think I did not hit something that was like a solution for like 15 cards and I lost uh, my Displacer Kitten, I lost uh, another Tutor, I lost another piece. Like it was a really bad Tainted Patch for only digging like 15 cards deep until I hit Mind Break Trap, right? Now Mind Break Trap is not active in the sense that it would be free, right? But I'm still able to, because of all the mana I have open, hard cast a Mind Break Trap to, to stop Ranger Captain, right? My other option is I go and dig for silence, right? But the thing that's really preventing me from doing that, um, especially given how much like mana I have left over, right? So I'll still be able to like have three or four mana at this point, right? Or maybe I have two. I think I have two if I cast the Mind Break Trap, right? So we're looking at it and we're like, okay, let's just get the Mind Break Trap because I don't know where my silence is in my library and it's already been so insanely punishing to, to dig any deeper, right? So there's a chance that like I lose all my win cons in the time that it takes me to get a silence as a trade off for like losing a bunch of mana here, right? So I take the Mind Break Trap, I pay four mana, I hard cast the Mind Break Trap. It gets responded to <laughs> with a Fluster Storm. Uh, now, at this point, I've cast Painted Pact and Mind Break Trap, and our Blue Farm opponent has cast uh, the initial Ranger Captain Vios, and now the Flusterstorm, right? So there are four copies of Flusterstorm at my spell. I think we may have messed this up now that I'm thinking about it afterwards, because if I Fierce Guardianship one copy, and the Obnixilis player red blasts one copy. I'm pretty sure we might have actually had enough mana to, I feel like I'm missing a detail about why that's not how that worked, but I'm pretty sure that could have worked that way. There might've also been a Mox Diamond cast during that turn, which might be the other thing that I'm missing here. But for some reason, remembering back on it, it feels like maybe we could have potentially gotten out of it. I don't think so, uh, because I'm pretty sure at the time we did all the math, but that doesn't happen. 
So the Fluster Storm counters the Mind Break Trap, the Range Captain's back on the stack. Sissi goes, well, I might as well do something. I'm gonna Abrupt Decay the Ristic Study, right? Which which doesn't really change any of the exchange that just happened, uh, unfortunately, right? And, and had we sort of talked about it ahead of time, probably would have been a better move to hit the Ristic Study before the counter spells started flying, right? Um, because Blue Farm definitely had to draw some cards off of what I was doing, right? So that part was a little bit unfortunate timing wise. Um, and, you know, specifically them going for Ranger Captain into Flusterstorm uh, was actually the perfect configuration to beat a Fierce Guardianship, uh, whatever one mana spell I had in hand. Uh, it was not a Flusterstorm, to be clear. Uh, <laughs> but like Fierce Guardianship, Swan Song, like all of those things, right? Um, so at this point, I think due to their like paying life for some spells and stuff like that, they are down to five, right? But unfortunately, Ranger Captain does resolve and with the ETB in the stack, they crack it, right? So we are shut off of non-creatures for the turn. Um, they proceed to go Demonic Tutor, putting them down to three life. They cast Thassa's Oracle, putting them down to one life. And with the last mana they have floating, cast a Demonic Odd Station and they win the game. Uh, so our opponent was able to fight through like five pieces of interaction and uh, <laughs> get exactly enough to win with one life remaining, which was, you know, if you're going to be taken out in a semifinals game, that was a pretty cool way to lose the game. So <laughs> that's my tournament report. I, I got top 16, um, felt really good about my run in the Swiss, right? Um, not dropping a game for the entire Swiss is pretty awesome. Uh, you know, played three. Right. So three, knowing the Swiss and then drawing and then getting a buy. Right. So, um, but yeah, no, it was, it was it was a really fun run with the deck. Um, I'm feeling really good about playing it uh, three and one on the day overall. It felt pretty solid. I played it a couple times uh, last week and then uh, a few times after that as well. And then it, the deck feels pretty awesome. Obviously, just a high card quality deck. Right. The, the biggest downside definitely is going to be finding those win cons. Right. The wins are the toughest part about the deck because you really get Thassa's Oracle, Demonic Constellation, and then like Devary Kitten, and the rest of it is, you know, it, it, it's susceptible to removal and, and susceptible specifically to some a lot of the common interaction for the stack that is uh, commonly played in the format. But what you gain is a lot of advantage and a lot of consistency out of the command zone, which is pretty solid. Thank you all for watching. If you enjoy videos like this, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button. If you have any suggestions about the deck, any stuff you want to talk about for the tournament, make sure to leave those down in the comments below. They help out a ton and they're super free. Just like hitting like and subscribe. It all helps the channel out a ton. Uh, I know we mentioned coaching earlier. That part's super sick. And thank you to our sponsors for this episode as well. Thank you all for watching. It's greatly appreciated and I'll catch y'all next time.